boa tarde a todos. Muito obrigada pela presença. O Piano e Suas Perspectivas é um programa da Escola de Música e Artes Cênicas, Reitoria Digital da Universidade Federal de Goiás e a Mississippi State University. Com apoio da Fundação para a Ciência e Tecnologia de Portugal, Centro de Estudos de Sociologia e Estética Musical da Universidade Nova de Lisboa, Centro de Estudos Brasileiros, Rádio Universitária e Rádio Brasil Central FM. Fazem parte da equipe do programa Além de Mim, Maria Carolina Porto, Pablo Lisboa, Rosângela Yasbeck Seba, Sérgio de Paiva e Wesley de Menezes. Nossa proposta é levar a todos os interessados assuntos relacionados à importância da arte e seu papel na sociedade. A entrevistadora de hoje será a doutora Rosângela Seba, chefe do departamento de piano da Escola de Música da Mississippi State University. The Piano and Its Perspectives, it's a program of the School of Music and Performing Arts, Digital Department of the Federal University of Goiás and the Mississippi State University, with support from the Foundation for Science and Technology of Portugal, Center for Studies in Sociology and Musical Aesthetics of the New University of Lisbon, Center for Studies in Sociology and Musical Aesthetics in, of the New University of Lisbon, sorry, Center for Brazilian Studies, Radio Universitaria, and Radio Brasil Central FM. Besides me, Maria Cruline Porto, Pablo Lisboa, Rosângela Yasbeck Seba, Sérgio de Paiva, and Wesley de Menezes are part of the program's team. Our proposal is to bring to all those interested issues related to the importance of music and its role in society. The interviewer today will be Dr. Rosângela Seba, head of the piano department of the Mississippi State University. You are welcome, Dr. Seba. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the invitation. Today we have um, Dr. Barbara Fast. She's the head of the piano area in piano pedagogy from Oklahoma University. Thank you so much for being part of this program, Dr. Fast. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm thrilled to be here and um, I love traveling internationally. I've taught internationally, so I'm really thrilled to be able to uh, present to an international audience here. Thank you so much. This interview will be online uh, for a long time. And so if you want to invite people to watch later, you're more than welcome. We, we're gonna ask you questions and feel free to speak as much as you want. Um, the first question that I always ask my, the people that I interview is how and where did you start learning music and why piano and how did you get uh, interested in learning the piano? Mm, thank you for the question. That's a fun question for me. Uh, I, I'm very fortunate that music was a big part of my family and my extended family. Uh, interestingly enough, my mother was a flute teacher, so I grew up hearing her give flute lessons. Uh, I started taking piano at the typical age of six years old, and but of course I wanted to study flute because I was hearing my mother play the flute. And I ended up uh, really studying and pursuing both instruments equally in my mind. I would kind of flip back and forth where I was really focusing, but I ended up double majoring in flute and piano during my undergrad years. I kept up my flute playing during my master's, even though my master's in, is in piano. I actually had an assistantship in flute, which was just an odd combination, but I was happy. <laughs> I got to keep my flute playing going. I taught in India at an international school, and there I really kept I taught both and I really kept both performing. I actually did a double flute concerto with the Delhi Symphony and I've never played a piano concerto with the symphony. So, you know, I think all of us sometimes have really unusual um, paths to get to where we are. And um, the one thing that my double major has really helped me now, my passion is teaching group piano here at the university. So I'm dealing with students who are majoring in flute and trombone, trying to learn piano. And I feel like it, I like to think it gives me, um, I don't know, an extra understanding of what they're going through because I know some of those instruments uh, very well. So tell me more about your, um, how you became a professor, how you became a teacher, because you said that you were a double major and I assume and I may be wrong, that it wasn't performance, right? Correct, correct. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Well, uh, again, that's an interesting question. I grew up on a farm in central Kansas, and uh, I distinctly remember coming home from school, going right upstairs in our house. The first thing I would do would be to play teach. I would have this imaginary group of students in front of me. I had a big blackboard in back of me, and I would pretend to teach exactly what I just learned that day. And I've always, I've always thought, what a strange thing to do. <laughs> but I actually think um, uh, teaching has always felt pretty natural and innate. And I've always maintained, if I weren't teaching music or piano, I would be teaching something. I, I, I love teaching, and it feels pretty natural to me. Um, and so I think that all solidified into piano pedagogy uh, finally at the time that I did my doctorate in piano pedagogy here actually at the University of Oklahoma. Um, but um, yeah, I, I think I've just always loved teaching. And, and how did you get involved? Because today you are a reference for group piano. You are a reference all, all over the United States as well as around in Europe. Well, we met in Europe, in, in one of the conferences there. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, it's been a while, isn't it? Um, and you are a reference for group piano. How did you get to the point where now you are the, the, the head of the, the piano area there in, at Oklahoma, and you're, you're an expert in group piano and piano teaching? Again, that's a, a really interesting question. We all <laughs> have different paths in our lives. One of my first jobs after India was teaching at a very a small private college, and I was teaching group piano, and I did, I mean, I, I often tell my new GAs this story. I said, I didn't know what I was doing. I kind of hated it, and I tried to get everyone to drop group piano and to go into private piano <laughs> lessons. But over time, once I finally figured out what I was doing, um, and the key thing is not to teach group piano as a private lesson. That's just a recipe for disaster, but to just approach it as teaching a group. And once I kind of figured that out, I just fell in love with it. And I still love it. Um, I think because it's just endlessly interesting for me. Um, you know, there's a lot of technology involved these days. Um, you never, your group varies. Every group is different. How is this group going to react? And I think it just keeps me constantly thinking about, you know, how can I introduce something that's going to be more effective for them? Um, and I just don't get bored teaching group because I think there's so many variables all the time and so many things that I have to consider. Um, how can you balance? Because, and, and that's the thing too. Would you expand a little bit about the group piano in, um, in teaching, in teaching piano, in performing. Uh, so you are still performing, you are still teaching piano lessons, you're still teaching group piano. Uh, it's a lot. And also being the head of the area, which you are coordinating a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, how, how do you balance that? Oh my, that's a good question. It's a good question for all of us. It probably would be a good question for you as well. On All of us are, are multitasking all the time. I will admit I am not performing um, at this point in time, but I'm doing, you know, what has kind of become a substitute for that is doing a lot of workshops and that sort of thing. Um, I have to say, I love doing workshops and that doesn't, that just feels like fun to me. So I don't have to feel like that's the balance. I think for me, I have a lot of administrative duties and, um, balancing that with teaching is probably the, the most difficult thing to do. But I think a lot of us um, have to do that of just kind of putting attention one place and then having to put it somewhere else on it. Um, and I think a lot of us have those various roles that we hold. Yeah. And sometimes we learn as, as it goes. <laughs> That's absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. Um, can you tell me a little bit more? I, I, I don't know if it's okay for me to ask you this, but can you tell me how many professors you're coordinating and how big is the area in um, the duties? Because I also, um, I, I watched you perform a collaborative uh, piano as a collaborative pianist. Mm -hmm. um, how many people do you coordinate in your area? Um, we have about... 
I, I always feel like my first level of responsibility is to my graduate teaching assistants. And um, because we have a doctoral program, we have between oh, eight, 10 or 12 um, graduate assistants. Some of those are in accompanying, but if they're in group piano, I directly supervise them. And um, I am pretty hands-on. I keep um, teaching. I at least always teach one section of group piano. And um, it, I just think it keeps me reality-based. Um, I know what my GAs are going through. It's um, right now I love team teaching and I will often kind of team teach with another grad student if they're doing internship teaching. And I love that because I've taught so long and you might understand this as well. It'd be very easy for me to just walk into class and not really thoroughly plan anymore, but my teaching just goes downhill very fast. I mean, that's the worst thing in the world. So when I'm team teaching with someone we, we literally plan an hour for every class and, and that keeps the teaching really, I don't know, it, that really forces me to keep thinking about it. And I, I feel really good about it. It's, it's always planned. Um, in our area, piano area, we have about five of us um, who are, have various responsibilities in the, um, in the piano area. So I'm doing primarily pedagogy. We have another pedagogy and applied professor um, to straight uh, applied professors, and then one co uh, professor in charge of collaborative piano. Yeah. Um, excuse me. And, and do you uh, still coordinate them, or they have separate? Do you guys meet together? And yes, we do. Thank you for asking that. Uh, we have a weekly meeting, um, and and I know sometimes I, I think, gosh, do we really need to meet this week? But honestly, I have an agenda every week, and I think the weekly meeting is what has kept us. I don't know, kind of vibrant and alive on it in terms of keeping events moving forward. And um, it means that it gives us a chance as a faculty to meet every week and, and other things will come up that are not on the agenda. And it allows us, and, and as I think about it right now spontaneously, it's probably those spontaneous things that come up that allows us to keep I, I like to think we keep a coherence as a department and that way it, it allows us to be in touch with what, I don't know, some things we're experiencing with students and um, yeah, so I think that's just really important. It's hard sometimes too, isn't it, to keep that <laughs> weekly? <laughs> yeah. Um, you wrote a book, I Practice Technology in the 21st Century Music Practicing Room practice room and it's published by Oxford and um, can you talk more about your book? Yeah, thank you again. Thank you for asking that. Um, it's kind of a, I'll try to keep the story short on how that came about. Um, I was still um, back um, some years back when I was doing still quite a bit of chamber music performing. Um, my brother um, is a member or was a member of the New York, he's a contrabassoonist with the New York Philharmonic and we're very close in age and we're good friends. And they were, he went through a period of time where they were doing a new work once a week on it. And I would hear all the time about his practicing and he was just devising, you know, kind of um, brainstorming creative ways to just learn music very, very quickly. And I was working on a, a new piece of music also at that time. And we met over Christmas and I was frustrated. I, I, some, yeah, I was working on a passage. It didn't get better. And he came over and he said, well, Barbara, why don't you try da, 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 da. His suggestions were felt so unusual to me. And I thought, wow, you're in the New York Phil. And you're, you know, he was like taking little passages and putting them into like Sibelius or, and having the computer play this back to him at 50% speed. So he could hear it, the oral modeling, and he could play along with it. And I thought, wow, when there is no oral model, you went to a lot of work to create an oral model. And then sometimes he would actually learn it at a just super slow, play it into the computer, have the computer play it back so he could play along with himself. He also, it, I had a handwritten score and then he played around with re-notating the score just to make it, not changing the notes, but making it easier to read. Mm -hmm. All of that, I, I was just kind of shocked. I thought, wow, you're doing these really basic, going to a lot of work to do some very basic practice techniques. And I had been researching practice, um, you know, for many years. I, I've just been interested in it. But that led um, to doing a research study with the New York Philharmonic on how they practice when they have new, new works. Um, I ended up 
doing that research study with a very good colleague, Jennifer Mishra, um, who is, I, I, we used to teach together um, at another institution, and she's just a wonderful researcher, wonderful writer. And we did that study together and all we did a presentation at a conference. And um, then we just got approached by Oxford to write the book. And it really is a book on practicing. There's just a lot of practice ideas. What I'm really happy about, there's a lot of research in it. It's written in a, we, we called it blog style writing, whatever that is. Um, and the end notes, we made sure that the end notes are just very friendly to read. I mean, you know how, you know, so, sometimes footnotes are just, they're too academic, you know, it's hard to understand, but we really worked very, very hard to make everything very, like a very fast read on it. So, so uh, you know, I've always been interested in practicing and the research behind it. Do you mind if I ask how long did it take for you to put in Sibelius? Did it take too much time of your practicing time? Um, you know, you, you just have to, you get, re, you have to find a program that you get really good at. And I actually now advise students, use something easy like Note Flight or something mm -hmm. like that on it. So um, I think the important thing is just to find something that, that works for you in the moment on it. Yeah. Um, so in, in the case of your research, um, and, and I know that you have given many workshops and um, I was also attending one of yours here in Mississippi when you were the guest artist for our conference. Um, there are all sorts of questions, right? And most of them is how to be efficient in, in your practice. <laughs> is there anything else you would like to give an advice to a young student in our advice to a teacher that is listening and would like to know more about how to help the students to, to learn faster? Well, um, that opens up a whole <laughs> several topics that I talk about a lot, and I don't know um, where we want to go with it. Um, I, I was thinking about this this morning. I thought, gosh, which one, you know, once we start moving into these kind of topics for practicing, um, maybe to start with, uh, one of the things I talk about pretty frequently um, is, the, and I'm just going to reference it very briefly, the brain's negativity bias, which is that our brain naturally will hold on to negative experiences more easily or faster than positive experiences. And I can talk a lot about that, but um, I th think the second thing to note about that is um, negative experiences like criticism will impact our brain really quickly. And it's um, embedded in our brains really fast where positive experiences, the research says it takes about 12, 12 seconds for a positive experience to really go into long-term memory. Yeah. Knowing that, um, if I talk about some of the other things that have come up in the research about how our brains learn the best, and a lot of these things apply to sports and music, um, I, I think it makes sense to know that our, 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 our brain really reacts to negative experiences and kind of holds on to that and um, re reacts more slowly or it takes longer for positive experiences to go into long-term memory. Um, I also would like for you to talk, and because I mentioned you this week when I was uh, teaching one of my students. Um, he, he is a young pianist, a uh, great facility, mm -hmm. and we were trying to memorize a prelude in few by Bach. Mm -hmm. And he was just thinking note by note, <laughs> which is, <laughs> and I told him, well, good luck if, you, if you're you doing this way. Um, but I mentioned to you ab about you, because one of the workshops that I attended, you mentioned about the space mm -hmm. and uh, you, you practice a little section and then you give time and then you come back to it, which, which is something that I had used, but I never put it in words. <laughs> um, and so I told him that like, we were going to learn four measures and then we took a break and then he played something else. And then in the middle, I said, well, let's go back to those four measures. And then he could remember. And then we added more four and so on until the hour was done. But um, talk, can, would you mind talking about that? 
Oh, that's one of my favorite topics. <laughs> I'd love to talk about it. And, and kudos and bravo to you for trying that out in your teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to, you know, eventually hear more from you, kind of what your thought was um, after using it. But uh, what the research shows is that um, our our brains, you know, if you remember that negativity bias thing, our our, our brains learn best at the very beginning, but when to start something is a lot of effort on it. So that um, when we do tricky, we have hard things to learn, um, our brain is going to do more encoding or learning if we space out that practicing. And there's different ways to space it out. There's all kinds of research that shows, you know, Sleeping, you know, practice one day, then practice the next day. There's a lot of learning that happens overnight. That's why practicing every day works because our brain can consolidate information overnight. But what you were working on with your student is one of my favorite things to work on um, interleaved or I sometimes, as such a hard word, um, rotational practice, interspersed practice. And I, I do exactly what you did. Um, when I see a student struggling with something that is kind of persistent um, and it's kind of an, uh, an area, you know, very identifiable or an issue, I used it most recently with a student where I was working on a rotation technique. She'd never used it. She was just used to, you know, a, a real stiff arm. And I was working on this. That was really, really difficult. She was playing pretty advanced music. That was really hard for her to do. But she's very smart and very determined. And I finally said to her, you know, and I could tell this was really, um, it was difficult for her to, to, you know, it was very mentally taxing for her to work on. I said, okay, let's do interleaved practice with it. And um, I said, you know, just do three minutes in your practice, do something else and come back to it. And I could tell she was, first of all, she was relieved on it. Oh, you know, we don't like to do things that are hard. We don't. It's, you know, remember that negativity bias thing. Um, and I, I did say, and I tell students, I usually say, just experiment with the time. Try three minutes, five, seven, nine. Just experiment with the time, but then rotate with it. Um, and I, I usually find students will come back with a really strong reaction of, oh, five minutes was perfect for me. Seven was too long. Or they'll come back and say, seven was perfect. Five was too short. I had a feeling she was so mentally taxed with this that, you know, I usually don't even suggest three minutes, but I thought three minutes would probably work for her. And she went with that and she did, you know, what I find with, um, if I just make it really specific, like you did in your teaching, take this one passage and rotate that. Um, I almost, I, I, it's like, I just know they're going to improve. I just know it's going to work <laughs> and they'll come back the next week and, you know, they'll say, wow, that really helped. And if I can get them to buy into that, then when something comes up again, I've even had students eventually, when they've used it enough, I've even had them spontaneously say, oh, you know, I think I should interleave practice this on it. So that's when I know, oh, yay. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> well, I, I, I know that that's become a tool for them that they can use. Now, you know, ideally what the research talks about is interleaving everything you're practicing, like rotating everything. In all honesty, um, when I start introducing it with students, I usually pick one thing like you did in your lesson. I pick one thing to rotate because I feel like I've got to get them kind of hooked on it. Mm -hmm. I, I think and the I think what's important to know, and I always tell students, I'm very upfront about it. I say, um, this is not going to it's not intuitive. You are not going to want to stop. And looking for my phone is usually right by me. And I just say, use your cell phone, put a timer on, um, because otherwise you're going to want to keep practicing. So I'm just really upfront by saying, you know, you may not want to do this. Um, it's not intuitive or we'd all be doing it. We would all be doing it if it were intuitive. But we're all, I think, naturally, rather, I call, it's called block practice, where you practice one thing finish it, go on to the next thing, finish it and go on to the next thing. What happens with that blocked practice is that you there's such a sense of improvement during the time and that's just very unmotivating that we wanna just keep practicing. And the research shows that yes, if someone heard you that day, 
uh, you you might be judged better with that blocked practicing, but the research shows if someone hears you in three days, five days, seven days, it's the interleaved practice that will take you further on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I just say it's not intuitive. Um, what's so interesting with the research, uh, when they ask, so uh, in these studies, uh, the evaluators will say, yes, uh, the the students or performers who did interleague practice are better with um, the interleague practice. When um, the, the performers are asked, and, and they know this, they know they got better results with interleague practice. And then when they're asked, which do you prefer? They still say they prefer blocked practice. I know. And and I, I, I tell all that to my students. So saying, you know, it, just be aware, put on that cell phone timer, kind of trust that this is going to work for you. Experiment with it, but trust and um, see see where it takes you. So I'm pretty upfront about the research and um, that it's not, it really is not intuitive or we would all be using it. And you mentioned something about variable practice. Um, can you describe the the chain uh, the, the the differences between yeah. interleaved and variable? Yeah, so it, interleaved is a timing thing like rotating practice. Um, variable practice is um, um, and and this we do. I, I think we all do to to some extent. We can just do more of it. It is not practicing the passage the same way. So doing something different. And particularly, um, I often re reference Spencer Meyer. Um, I heard him do a workshop at NCKP and it was, he used, he referenced the brain and I don't think he'd really read brain research, but he kept saying, you know, to, for us to really learn, for our brain to really learn it. And I went, aha. <laughs> you know? I, and I knew he was talking about variable practice. So it's just, um, so we know we have the idea, you know, to work out a, a technical passage. Okay, we're going to practice with different rhythms like da, da, di, da, da, or da, 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 da. And then there's endless variations of that. Um, you can take it even further. Oh, can you change uh, the rhythm in the middle of a passage on it? Can you play a very loud passage very soft? Can you play a very soft passage very loud? Can you play a, a fast passage very slow, a slow passage very fast? All of that, um, the research just shows that all, you know, the more you can vary your practice, the better the learning. And particularly, I think, for pianists where we're working on memory on it, yeah. it is absolutely um, kind of golden. It, it, it's golden. And I think the thing is just to remember, you know, to be willing to take that really far, that variable practice, to really go to extremes. Um, so I don't think that one is such a new idea, but maybe just taking it, you know, really far down the road on it. And I, I know for myself, when I think back on my practicing, there were certain things I would do. I, I did a lot with um, varied rhythms, but did I change the rhythms in the middle of a passage? No, I didn't do that. Did I really work with extremes of dynamics, um, extremes of tempo? No, I didn't do that. So I, I think just really building in lots of variety into our practice toolbox. Um, and it will help us learn faster and learn more efficiently. I, um, if it is okay, I, I noticed, um, I've been teaching 35 years, um, and I've noticed a huge change in the learning path of the students. And, and not for better, <laughs> but uh, I've noticed that the internet, the online, access has also made the students with um, focus span very short. Okay. And um, I just want to go back to the interleaved mm -hmm. uh, practice. And um, do you think it has helped the students, especially nowadays with some, with, I would say a lack of focus, because that's what we are having even in younger age. Um, do you think it helps? Oh, ab absolutely. And I, um, when I do these workshops, um, I'm always, I'm amazed um, if the workshop is large enough, I, uh, there 
sometimes are will be several teachers that will raise their hand and saying, I am doing basically I'm doing interleave teaching, meaning I am rotating what I'm hearing in the lesson like you did in the lesson. And I they're doing that particularly with young students because of focus and attention on it. And absolutely. Um, I, I, I think. Um, you know, particularly with young children, I, I remember we aren't running in demo classes now, but when we were even, and this is really, you know, maybe almost about 10 years ago before the internet really, um, the social media hadn't quite caught on to the extent that it has now. But even then we would, we would plan nothing more than five minutes at a time with a group and then move to another activity on it. But I think as us as private teachers, just to be willing to experiment with that. That's not how we were taught, most likely, but to be willing to experiment with that. Um, I have tried in my group teaching, and now I, I, I tell my GAs, I, I try to keep an activity, even, and these are college-age kids, to five minutes. Now, if I'm introducing a repertoire, I know that may take 10 minutes or so, but I'd rather do short and do it more frequently or come back. And I've really worked with myself on this. Like if I thought, gosh, we need to work on scales and we, we need 10 minutes on it. Well, let's do one group, one way of practice for five minutes and come back later and do scales again, maybe a new group or a different practice technique on it. So I'm, I'm doing my best to try to incorporate interleave teaching as well. And like I said, you did that. <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to throw a question back at you since we're talking about interleave teaching. What was your experience? Um, I'm just very interested when you experimented with a student of the four majors, go to something else, and, and then you came back to it. It was very successful. In fact, I've I've been doing this for a long time because more and more I've I've noticed also the students that we are getting in undergrad are less prepared mm -hmm. than they used to be prepared. Uh, by the time you know we would get a person in undergrad, we knew that they went over certain things and all. Nowadays, we get those that can sight read like crazy, but memorization is a problem, or those who memorize everything but cannot sight read. Okay. And we have those that did scales, some of the scales, not all the scales, not all the arpeggios. And I don't like Baroque, but I like classical. I like, you know, so it's a variety of um, deficits that mm -hmm. we're having right now. And so what I do is instead of just focusing on the negativity, <laughs> what you don't know, <laughs> Uh, try to also uh, let them choose. I let them choose one piece per semester that they would like to play, and the rest I will choose. And uh, when it comes to memorization, most of them memorize by um, muscle memory sometimes um, or oral, but they, the analytical is not there. Mm -hmm. So I, we, we try all sorts, and, and I said there are several types of memories. Let's use all of them, because if one fails, the other one will support the other. And even then, I mean, um, we have problems, you know, it's just, it's just, it is what it is. But one thing that I have uh, done that has really helped them focus is put a headphones with something completely different, Usually I, I use heavy metal because it's a very loud and non-coherent for, for us. Um, and also in let them play by memory their piece with that sound. And sometimes I also impair the vision. So I also will um, turn off the lights or turn on, turn off, turn on, especially if they're getting ready for a competition or a recital, because that can happen too. I remember one of my, before COVID, I was playing and somebody was playing with the lights behind stage. Somehow they hit a button, the, the light went off and the projector came on, <laughs> right on me. <laughs> you know, things like that. And the headphones has helped them focus and sing inside. It's not a matter of just relying on what you listen, but sing as you play, so that that has been very helpful. The interleaved, I call intermittent, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. of wording, 
but uh, interleaved in uh, memorization with the headphones. And usually I would tell them, do you have your headphones? And they already look at me, okay, we're gonna do that. I said, yes, we're gonna do that. Um, it has helped. I mean, and again, these are things that uh, growing up, I didn't have to do, but, but we were brought up differently, you know? That that's a wonderful idea. I'm going to try that myself. I I I learned some that I learned something today, and it was from you. I haven't tried that the um, the headphones and then playing, you know, with something like heavy metal as as a distraction, and that actually would fall into the variable practice mm -hmm. camp of things. One thing I've done um, with uh, cell phones, I'll have sometimes I'll have students um, record. I'll, I'll have them put their phone down on the piano, and just Sometimes I'll say, you know, let's just record um, your playing today. And sometimes we use it, sometimes we don't. But if I have started to use that, have them listen to their playing, I always say, what went well? They have to list. They have to list to me what went well before they list what they want to improve on. Um, but if we've done that in the lesson, then I can also assign. You know, I'd like you to record yourself three times during the week, focusing on da 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 da. And if I've done that, then I can, I, one thing that has really worked with me with um, anxiety with students is to say, I want you to walk into your practice room, try to get on a different piano mm -hmm. every day. <laughs> I don't care if it's a bad piano. In fact, that sometimes it's better. Um, do not do a warm up, but I want you to video record yourself visually so you can see yourself and do that every day and watch your video. And that has been really helpful. I've gotten students who've reported um, back to me, Dr. Fast, I had to play blah, blah, blah. And I wasn't nervous at all. And I went, yay. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but it, it's all in that, just like you were doing with headphones, it's trying to um, get our brains to work in kind of new and different ways, not just be on this zone track. Um, so that we, when we do hit, um, you know, the nerves um, that, we have backup tools that we've used before. Yeah. Uh, let me let me ask you something because you are dealing with graduate students, but as well the uh, undergrads. Mm -hmm. um, what would be an advice that you would give to a young student or a young musician in general, and then be specific about piano? Okay. Um, if I'm thinking undergraduate, and if I'm thinking what I what comes into my office, I um, <laughs> sometimes my colleagues will say, they'll tell a student, "No, go talk to Dr. Do Fast." <laughs> and, and, and you, I think maybe it's because I'm the more senior member at this point or something. But um, I, I'm often talking with um, you know students at the undergrad level, and I completely get it. Um, they're trying to decide what to major in. Can't you know? Should they major in piano? Should they do a double major? What should they do? My and I, I very much understand that because I was double majoring flute and piano. I almost majored in English. I couldn't decide what to major in, even though I was functioning like fully like a music major all the time. I still always just kind of felt undecided. So I really get that when I hear that from students. My biggest advice is to keep to at the undergrad level to go as broad as possible in their career decisions on it. Mm -hmm. I feel so strongly that um, what is going to help people stand out in any field is Yes, being very good at what you do, but what are the unusual things that you bring to the table that no one else does? That is ultimately what is going to help you stand out on it. We have a lot of undergrads who are double majoring right now, and I really encourage them, you know, don't drop the music, don't, um, you know, keep up your double major if you can. Um, keep, you know, go broad. There's kind of a big push to get through as quickly as, as possible. And I'm kind of on the opposite side saying, if you can take time, if you can manage uh, these various things, go ahead and do them. They will only, they will only serve you well. And I, I, my personal story, um, 
so I do work with doctoral students and I'm dealing with writing dissertations and all. And I, I so often will tell my students, um, I'm two hours short of an English major just to let them know, okay, I'm going to, I can't help but I'm going to look at your writing. Yeah. Um, and I, I said that to, in two days in a row. And honestly, this fall semester, and I thought, what do I really have? I called up my undergraduate institution. I knew they could look this up. They did. They said, you don't have an English major, but you have an English minor. They said, it's not designated. And I said, would you designate it? And I immediately changed my bio. So now it's a story I tell my undergrads all the time that um, I, I could have had that listed my entire life as this having an English minor. And I, you know, would it have changed drastically? Probably not. Would it have changed somewhat? Maybe. I don't know. So I'm, I'm rambling on and on, but my, I'm kind of on this kick when I'm particularly with undergrads, graduate students to really think broadly for yourself in, you know, don't try to limit too, too quickly. Um, and, and your music is not everyone can do music and your yes. music, not everyone. And they're so envious of you. Yes. And, and it's so easy for us just to accept and assume that because compared to the rest of the population, it is easy for us, but you having that on a degree, just, it's going to have you help you stand out. It will help you stand out. And um, yeah, I had, I had a double me. I was keeping a double major, but in Brazil, where I'm from, we cannot double major in the same university. So some of my colleagues, just like me, we would go in the morning to one university and in the evening to another university. And I didn't end my double major. I ended up dropping the other one, uh, which was business administration. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to tell you that I use some of it now that I'm coordinating certain things. And you have to think a little bit more as a, as a business person. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, uh, we just had in our pedagogy class somebody that came and spoke to them about how to handle your students financially, how to prepare yourself for a retirement and billing and, and commercializing your studio and things like that. We all have to have those abilities and not only to play the piano or do something. Right. right. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. No, I, I was going to say thank, thank you for sharing that because you're also an example of someone with kind of multiple abilities that has really served you well. Uh, in your life. I, one reason I really love piano pedagogy is I watched almost everyone in piano pedagogy um, has multiple strengths. Usually that group of people is really good at several things on it. So I think it's a, it's a field where those of us who enjoy several things can be comfortable because we meet other people who also have various skills and not just one skill that they're doing. That's true. Um, so what, I, know, I mean, it's silly for me to ask you this, what is your career goal? Because you already has a, reached so many goals in your life. Um, but is there something that gives you pleasure or is there anything that you're still searching for um, as a professional musician, as a teacher, as a, as a pedagogue and, and, and all, all the above? Um, what is your goal in life um, as you are reaching a point where in your career right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a really interesting question. It's always interesting for all of us all along the way, I think. Um, personally, I'm very aware that um, I think I get the greatest pleasure out of um, helping a student um, accomplish something that they think they could not accomplish. And I think it's one reason I love teaching the first level of group piano, because we can get them very quickly from doing nothing to actually playing interesting music. And I love that kind of just huge um, transformation that's often very surprising to them and very gratifying. And I, I think one of the most, I, I, this happened much earlier in my career, a student, she was only intermediate level or so, but um, I'll never forget it. After a semester, she, I don't know, she wrote me or told me, I don't remember which, saying, you know, thank you. Um, I am playing so much better than I ever thought I could. And I went, yay. 
<laughs> because I just think that's so self, that's so empowering to people. And that's kind of my, uh, that's kind of what motivates me in teaching is if I can get students to kind of do better than they thought they could. And um, that's, I don't know, that's just really fun for me to do on it. Um, kind of on another tack, I, I'm, I remain really interested in kind of brain, how our brain works and brain and learning. And yes, that translates and that learning translates into music or how we most efficiently learn piano. But that's really a, a real ongoing interest of mine. And I have a couple articles I need to write, that kind of thing. But um, uh, just that efficiency of learning and a lot of those tips um, are not necessarily intuitive. So it really, we almost have to know about them to do them because we're not going to, or a lot of us are not naturally going to do all of them. Mm -hmm. So you kind of like already answered my question, the next question, which was, what is the best feeling in a competition <laughs> of the teacher? Um, is there anything else that you wanted to say that is your um, that makes you happy as a teacher, as a musician, as a administrator? Um, what makes you happy? Um, yeah, I I think um, watching students transform or or be able to go from point A to B, and knowing that I was able to help be a part of that in some way um, is, is very motivating for me and very encouraging. And I, it's really uh, thrilling to watch. And um, at the graduate level, um, you know, helping students find their own unique um, passion. It's the one thing I really, at the graduate level, tell students, um, you, you have to pay attention to what you're weak at. We all have weaknesses. And in school, one of your jobs is goals is to fill in those weaknesses. That's why you're here. But at the grad level, also, I just think it's really, really important to pay attention to also what you do well, what your passions are, because that is what is going to lead you into doing something unique, um, and you'll have the energy to spend time developing something. Pay attention to that because that's what's going to carry you forward. Um, so kind of helping, I don't know, just helping facilitate students in that way. Um, I, I, I really enjoy and I get a thrill out of seeing people kind of take on their own. Oh, wow. They own this topic. You know, they'll suddenly own something no more than I do. And great. Uh, that's, you know, that's exactly what should be happening. Yeah. Um, I, I would like to ask you a question because you are um, the head in, in a year ago in the spring of 2020. At least it was in our spring break. <laughs> Uh, and all of a sudden we get it, this um, COVID is hitting the United States. And uh, I remember being my spring break, preparing for MMTA um, regional evaluations here. I was in charge of it <laughs> in the state of Mississippi. And then all of a sudden everything was canceled, right? Everything was yes. canceled. And I think in a way there's always good and bad in everything in life. Um what was your experience? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, we could talk for another hour, right? Yes, we can. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, oh my gosh, um, uh, panic and and what do we put in place? And you just go with kind of what you can do that's going to keep everyone as sane as possible on it. In group, um, we only kept it going that semester. We were at our ten week exam. Thank goodness. We actually went to online, and you know if they get. If the students did not have keyboards, we they did paper keyboards and all. And so we altered some of the assignments. Now, by the fall, um, we could gather, we could get our act together and, and we, you know, we, we went on a different track. We didn't re revert to that full time on it. But, um, you know, we all got used to teaching online. And the one thing I found, I mean, I am so much happier teaching in person. I really am teaching group, but I also found, and I think a lot of people discovered, I could teach group piano 
um, you know, on Zoom too. I had a keyboard, I had the overhead cam, the whole nine yards on it with enough, you know, different angles on the piano and so forth. And, um, you know, um, that works. And I've had GAs who continue to do more videos, you know, as just reference videos for students. And I think that really came out we got used to doing them during the COVID at the beginning. And some of that we have just continued to go forth. And I think what I think it has allowed, at least what I see around me, is just, you know, we've just enlarged our toolbox for what we can use. You know, maybe I'm going to use recorded videos, maybe I'm not. Um, but I think we're all, we've had more experience with it now. And um, so it's allowed, yeah, I think it's just enlarged our toolbox for all of us. Yeah, well, I, we did the same. We, we did a lot of videos and stuff like that. And um, I'm also teaching your training in, in theory. <laughs> that was interesting. But uh, I still I am a very strong proponent of face to face lessons. Mm -hmm. I think to tell somebody that please relax this muscle or that muscle instead of just reach out and demonstrate. Um, it's, it's a faster, faster tool. Yes. But yes, we, we expanded our boxes as much as we could. Do you have any future plans, Barbara, to um, Dr. Fast, to, to give a um, workshop? Do you want to let us know what is coming next so we can keep track of your mm -hmm. workshops and lectures and, and maybe a next book or? Mm -hmm. Um, I'm presenting at um, M MTNA coming up in Minneapolis. I'm really looking forward to being in person um, at um, in Minneapolis. Um, I'm going back for the Minneapolis State Conference, presenting um, as kind of a clinician on it and with a range of topics um, yet to be decided, but probably centered around um, various practicing ideas and um possibly the brain's negativity bias on it. Um, so that's upcoming. Um, uh, you know, maybe I'll be in Australia for the ISME conference. I haven't quite decided on that one. <laughs> so, um, but uh, we'll kind of see how COVID, you know, how the pandemic, how things just kind of keep moving forward. Um, this this uh, video interview will we'll reach out to uh, South America. And right now we have some people from Colombia. There's always somebody from Cuba um, in Europe as well. And uh, I just would like for you to, because this is another topic, but to end up, you are co-founder of NCKP, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. So in the GP3, mm -hmm. um, would you explain to the people outside mm -hmm. the United States what, what NCKP is and GP3 is? Okay, I am a co-founder of GP3, which is the National Group Piano and Piano Pedagogy Forum. That's, you know, there's the the G, you know, group at piano and piano pedagogy, the three P's on it. Um, and that came about, uh, our first conference was in 2000. It came about because all of us teaching group piano and piano pedagogy would meet at conferences. We'd go out to lunch together and we'd, we'd share ideas and talk about our issues and our problems. And we said, we need a conference because we're meeting together all the time anyway. We need a conference so we're not just doing this over lunch and dinner. And um, we, we started that, you know, with the goal of keeping it very small. And um, we've always had between 80 and 100, 120 attend. Um, and it's just focused on college and group piano teaching at the collegiate level on it. Um, I, I've been thrilled. Uh, we're going to we're having our next conference in 22 at University of Tucson in Arizona. And we never envisioned it would keep going this long. We, I mean, we just really, it was to address our needs and what we needed. We thought, well, if we have a couple conferences, great. And it may just die out. In about 08, MTNA came along and took us under their, their umbrella, which helped us organizationally. On it. We, I don't think we could have kept going doing you know, organizing an entire national conference year at, I mean, and we hold it um, biannually every two years. I am not the co-founder of N national of NCKP, but I've been very involved with it. And that is the national conference on keyboard pedagogy, um, which operates under the Francis Clark Center for um, mm -hmm. Piano Teaching. That's a wonderful um, 
they have just put out so many um, videos and so many resources for piano teachers. And they, they really are reaching out internationally as well. And then I'm very involved with um, MTNA, Music Teachers National Association, and they as well have been doing so many um, webinars and seminars reaching out to people. So I would, um, one of the things um, that I really encourage uh, young teachers is to be involved with your local teacher association. I just cannot say that strong enough. That is where um, teachers make connections. I always know, I mean, I get a lot of phone calls of just parents in the community wanting the re reference of a teacher. Mm -hmm. And they say, well, um, there's a teacher reference site with our local group. And I just say the most professional teachers will belong to a professional organization. And that has allowed me to, um, I don't know, we all, it, it's allowed me to share ideas, meet people. Um, I love collaborating with people. And how do you meet people? You have to, you know, we teach privately. So these organizations are really, really important. I would say to young people, um, every organization is going to welcome you with open arms. Um, they, they need people, they, they need help. And if you're at all interested, they are going to love having you attend. Um, I've worked, in fact, I was just on the nominating committee for our Oklahoma um, board. And my big goal is always to get young people involved because they will help move the profession forward. I know they're going to gain so much from it. I have gained so much um, from all of these organizations over the years. And um, I, I just can't say enough about that. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. Um, I also think that uh, being a young college professor when I came uh, to Mississippi State 20 21 years ago, um, I had to get to know the teachers in the region. And being involved with yes. MTNA, MMTA, uh, allowed me to not only help them, because we have some resources that they need, but they helped me to understand the region, the students, the demographics, and, um, and get to know also my colleagues in, in other institutions. It's very important to be part of an association. It's very important. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm really proud of our region. We have a very strong piano teaching. It's a, a rural area, and uh, mm -hmm. we are still making music and trying even <laughs> through COVID. Um, yeah. But anyway, I, um, I can talk to you more and more. I, I guess we can even expand more topics. But above all, I just would like to, to thank you for all the work you do. And I know that the administration part of the GP3 and all other things in, that you do in, in, in research and teaching, it has uh, brought um, a stronger group of piano teachers to, to the market. And um, I thank you for that. That's, that's a wonderful job. And, um, it's really nice uh, to get to know you more and more as the time goes by. So thank you very much. Is there anything else you would like to, so we can wrap up our interview, anything you would like to say? Uh, well, uh, th thank you uh, for your kind comments. Again, thank you for the invitation. And um, um, to all um, everyone out there, um, you know, carry forth as teachers. You're, we're all in a w really wonderful profession together, I think. Um, we are influencing people's lives. We are influencing the younger generation's lives. And we get to do that in a, I, I almost could start crying about it. We get to do it in a very personal way. Um, uh, we, we really do. And that's just a very, and we get to do, you know, an art, you know, making music, you know, it's not, you know, it's just not teaching math. We get to do something very creative and help people in their creative pursuits. And uh, we're so fortunate to be able to be involved that way, I think. So, I mean, congratulations to anyone listening, um, because you are, um, you are touching lives in, in many, many ways. Well, I would like to thank you for accepting our invitation and thank you so much for spending time with us. Um, the interview will be online in YouTube. Um, and it's going to be there for a longer time. And I would like to also thank Andrea Teixeira for allowing us to interview you this month. And um, 
Thank you very much, Dr. Fast. Um, if you would please, we're gonna be backstage, but if you wait a little bit, we will gather at the end and talk a little bit more. Thank okay. you very much. It, it, sounds, it sounds great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rose. Thank you so much, Dr. Fast. We are very honored with your presence. Thank you so much for sharing your brilliant professional life. Thank you very much. Thank you. You are welcome. Muito obrigada pela presença. Esse é um programa da Escola de Música e Artes Cênicas com a Reitoria Digital da Universidade Federal de Goiás e a Mississippi State University. Com o apoio da Fundação para Ciência e Tecnologia de Portugal, Centro de Estudos de Sociologia e Estética Musical da Universidade Nova de Lisboa, Centro de Estudos Brasileiros, Rádio Universitária e Rádio Brasil Central FM. Fazem parte da equipe do programa Além de Mim, Maria Carolina Porto, Pablo Lisboa, Rosângela Seba, Sérgio de Paiva, e Wesley de Menezes, muito obrigada pela presença de todos. The Piano and Its Perspectives is a program of the School of Music and Performing Arts, Digital Department of the Federal University of Goiás and Mississippi State University, with support from the Foundation for Science and Technology of Portugal, Center for Studies in Sociology and Musical Aesthetics of the, of the New University of Lisbon, Center for Brazilian Studies, Radio Universitaria and Radio Brasil Central FM. Besides me, Maria Caroline Porto, Paulo Lisboa, Rosângela Yasbeck Seba, Sérgio de Paiva and Wesley de Menezes are part of the program's team. Thanks so much to all of you for the audience. É, nós esperamos vocês na próxima semana. Esse programa, como a doutora Rosângela falou, ele fica disponível através do YouTube da Universidade Federal de Goiás. Muito obrigada pela presença e até a próxima semana.